Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Steve Slick, the director of the University's Intelligence Studies Project, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you today, including our special guest, Ambassador Phil Reeker, to this afternoon's webinar on diplomacy at the Center of American Foreign Policy. This is the latest in a series of virtual events held in connection with the Strauss Center's Next Generation Fellows Program. Format's relatively straightforward. Our host, Grumbly Fellow Gabriel Cortez, will introduce our guest speaker. After brief prepared remarks, Gabriel will then moderate a question and answer session with the ambassador until our time expires. And you all may start any time populating the Q&A box on our screen with your questions. So since our academic year is drawing to a close, I'll take this opportunity to congratulate all of our Brumley Fellows for their exceptional work in what's proven regrettably to be another challenging year for students of all ages. And Gabriel, I should mention, is emblematic of the quality of our Brumley Fellows. He graduates next month and will immediately begin a new career as a Foreign Service Officer with the United States State Department, where he was previously selected as a Charles Rangel Fellow. Now, before joining us at the LBJ School, Gabriel also served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ukraine. And he and I have been working together over the past year on a research project into the contributions of diplomatic reporting to US intelligence assessments. So congratulations, Gabriel, on all your terrific work and the boundless opportunities that lie before you. So with that, I'll ask you to introduce um, our guest today. Thank you very much, Professor Slick, and, and welcome everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, thank you for all, uh, joining us today. I'm very incredibly excited and honored to welcome our guest today. Acting Assistant Secretary Reeker has led the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs at the State Department since March 2019. Ambassador Reeker has had an incredibly distinguished career since joining the Foreign Service in 1992. Ambassador Reeker, uh, prior to his current role, was the Civilian Deputy and Policy Advisor to the Commander of U.S. European Command in Stuttgart, Germany. From 2014 to 2017, he served as the United States Consul General in Milan, covering Northern Italy. Uh, and that's where I got to know him uh, during my internship there. Uh, he has also served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the State Department um, for European and Eurasian Affairs. He's been ambassador to North Macedonia, Deputy State, State Department Spokesman, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs, Minister Counselor for Public Affairs at the US Embassy in Iraq, Deputy Chief of Mission in Budapest, and the Director of Press Relations at the State Department, in addition to several other roles. He's, again, very extremely qualified. Uh, Ambassador Reeker is a graduate of Yale University and received an MBA from the Thunderbird School of International Management in Arizona. His foreign languages include Italian, Hungarian, Macedonian, and German. Ambassador Reeker, it is a pleasure and an honor to welcome you here today. Well, thanks uh, very much, Gabriel, and uh, thank you, Director Slick. It is really a, a pleasure for me uh, to, to join you today, and, and I'm really honored that Gabriel remembered our time together working at the Consulate General in Milan back in 2015. Uh, I served as Consul General there. It is uh, one of our larger uh, consulates or constituent posts, part of the Mission Italy, covering uh, the north of Italy, which uh, in that consular district accounts for about 65% of the GDP of Italy, which of course is one of the world's largest economies. Um, and that year in 2015, we were participating uh, very actively in the World's Fair, the Milan Expo 2015, which was focused on uh, feeding the planet, food security, and, and how to feed uh, 9 billion people we expect on this planet by 2050. Uh, our U.S. pavilion, I'm proud to say, with Gabriel's help and the others on the team, was the most popular uh, pavilion at the Milan Expo, which was visited by some 22 million during those six months. Um, so that was a great time, great memories. Um, I find myself back here in Washington now in month 27 of what was supposed to be a six-month temporary assignment as the acting assistant secretary for Europe, um, but, but we keep at it. Uh, now, of course, in the last three months with a, a new administration, a very uh, exciting and interesting time. And I'm really pleased I can, uh, can join you for an important discussion about how the United States is focused now on renewing and revitalizing uh, engagement with the world, uh, but particularly um, uh, with uh, Europe, at least from the perspective that I share with my colleagues, some 300 people. Uh, here in Washington, D.C., and over 12,000 people spread across 
50 countries in Europe and Eurasia, uh, 79 posts we have, uh, including that great consulate that Gabriel remembers in, in Milan. Uh, I think it's a, a particularly important time. I don't have to, to say that to all of you listening and watching today. Uh, we face unprecedented challenges starting with, with COVID-19. I'm uh, just feeling uh, lucky that uh, I'm alone in this room so I could take off my mask. Otherwise here at the State Department, we are uh, wearing masks whenever we're with colleagues, even as people are getting vaccinated more quickly. You've all seen the devastation in uh, Europe from, uh, from COVID, what it's meant in human toll, particularly in Italy and Northern Italy, uh, where we began to see that uh, emerging uh, back in, uh, well, uh, late 2019, 2020. Uh, but now I think whether in the United States or, or overseas, um, we that are involved in uh, uh, diplomacy see that the diplomatic skills are needed to advance our foreign policy between and among uh, countries, uh, whether they're our partners or our competitors. Uh, and it's something that is uh, extremely sought after. And so I want to congratulate Gabriel and all your classmates um, on uh, completing your work. And I couldn't be prouder that you're joining the Foreign Service, something I uh, thought I would do uh, to give back a little bit to really um, serve our country maybe for a few years. Uh, and I'm now about to enter my 30th year in this business. So happy to hand off to you uh, and many others. I think uh, international affairs students at the University of Texas, Austin at the Robert Strauss Center are incredibly well um, placed and well um, trained and experienced to use those skills. Uh, and uh, I do hope many of you will consider uh, diplomacy. We value the partnership, in fact, that we have with UT Austin uh, for the annual Advanced Renewable Energy course, which is hosted by your Energy Institute. Uh, and over the last six years, we've sent department officers and experts uh, foreign energy leaders, even uh, European journalists uh, in, in person, and of course, over the past year or so, virtually to your campus to advance uh, their understanding of renewable energy forum forms uh, for the future. And um, that I think is in incredibly important and emblematic of some of the things that we focus on in diplomacy. Uh, we have a Bureau of uh, Energy and Natural Resource Affairs here in the department. And this is a major issue, energy security diversification of energy supplies, renewables, climate. These are, are key issues uh, that we're focused on uh, in transatlantic relations and, and globally. I think you've all heard uh, President Biden uh, say with a, in a very straightforward foreign policy message that uh, America is back. Uh, and since his inauguration, uh, the president's taken some immediate and concrete steps to restore uh, uh, our engagements and, and standing in the world, strengthening the national security workforce um, and rebuilding uh, our alliances across the globe, championing uh, American values and human rights. Um, and as the president has put it, trying to equip the middle class um, to succeed in a global economy. It reminds us that the, the three pillars of the foreign policy stool really are about uh, security, making sure we are um, secure as a nation against uh, a variety of threats, Prosperity, making sure that we focus on uh, economy and trade, a big part of the post-COVID uh, engagement, and of course about our values, uh, about democracy, and very much uh, under the Biden administration on focusing on what uh, Secretary Blinken refers to as the rules-based international order. It's quite uh, telling that uh, last year we celebrated, uh, commemorated really the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Uh, and it reminds us that for a period since 1945, we have had, particularly in the transatlantic space across Europe, uh, North America, uh, a period of, uh, historically speaking, unprecedented uh, uh, stability, peace. And that has led indeed to uh, an era of incredible prosperity, despite some of the challenges we have seen. Uh, that rules-based international order included the creation of institutions from the United Nations uh, to the Bretton Woods uh, agencies, uh, perhaps imperfect, but uh, evolving over time uh, to create rules of the road to uh, help us help each other uh, maintain a, a stability 
um, that's been very important. And I think we can use those uh, institutions, always mindful to update them for current challenges, uh, keeping in mind technology, the changing threats that we face. Uh, but, but those institutions and our alliances in particular are particularly uh, in, important. Um, in terms of uh, repairing relationships with European partners, I often will point out that uh, over the last couple of years when many Europeans and others were saying that oh, we were damaging uh, our, our relationships, we were burning bridges, I would often tell European partners, look, if that's how you view uh, some of the challenges uh, and differences we're having in our relations, just make sure you don't burn those bridges from the other side. And so we are able to, uh, to uh, repair, to revitalize relationships and really um, as the president's called for to uh, raise the level of ambition in our partnerships. Uh, I think diplomacy very much again at the center of uh, US foreign policy and, uh, and our international engagement grounded in our, our values. Um, and as I said, uh, in alliances. Uh, we just returned uh, with Secretary Blinken last week from a second visit in the space of just a month to, uh, to Brussels, to NATO, where we engage with the 29 other NATO allies, as well as partners. Uh, last week, focusing, of course, on Afghanistan and the way forward there, almost 20 years after we first went to Afghanistan in the wake of September 11th and the attacks uh, upon our country, the first uh, and so far only time that the alliance is declared under Article 5, an attack on one is an attack on all. Uh, we were there previously in March for the, uh, the annual, uh, actually I should say the, the more than one a year, but for the, uh, the first this year uh, in-person ministerial meeting of, uh, of the foreign ministers of the NATO countries. And Secretary Blinken, obviously still new in his position, was there to listen and engage. Uh, with all of his allies, uh, that kind of consultation and coordination is so crucial to what we're doing. Uh, the president, of course, has spoken since his inauguration with leaders of many of our closest allies to uh, focus on those bonds. Uh, as he said, leading with diplomacy means standing shoulder, shoulder to shoulder with our allies once again. He also spoke at the Munich Security Conference, virtually, of course, uh, and declared that the transatlantic alliance is very much back and that the partnership between Europe and the United States is and must remain the cornerstone of all that we hope to accomplish in the 20th century, just as we did in the 20th, in the 21st century, as we did in the 20th century. Um, so we remain very committed, uh, and that's where our bureau is sort of the tip of the spear, if you will, uh, in working closely with uh, partners from the European Union as a, as a collection of, uh, of 27 member states across the European continent, uh, from Reykjavik to, to Riga, um, to meet the, the various shared challenges that we face. I followed this uh, transatlantic relationship uh, for the almost 30 years of, of my career, most of it spent in Europe, although so much of what we do in Europe involves other regions of the world, the Middle East, whether serving in Iraq um, or working with European partners on the challenges we face there and in other parts of the world. Um, it reminds us, uh, as I've said, that uh, our alliances, uh, alliances based on shared values and shared sacrifices are among the greatest assets we have. Um, and I think uh, you see as we look at uh, our competitors, China and Russia, they don't have voluntary alliances. Uh, we realize more and more that to face the challenges of the 21st century, uh, we can't go it alone. Uh, we need to do these things um, with partners. We certainly uh, can succeed much better um, with partners. Uh, while we don't always see eye to eye with all of our partners in terms of threats we face and how to confront them, um, we focus on uh, diplomacy to allow us to discuss, to debate, uh, to come to consensus, whether it's at NATO or in organizations like the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, established to, uh, to help us find peaceful resolutions uh, to conflicts. I think it goes without saying really that in this, uh, this year now, well, more than a year of, of COVID-19 um, and focusing on implementing policies to fight the spread and immediate impact of the virus, uh, we, re-engaged right after the president's uh, inauguration with the World Health Organization 
to uh, to work in partnership with them. Another one of these institutions that's been created uh, to bring resources and knowledge together to address current crises. Uh, of course, we've announced over $4 billion to support the international vaccine facility COVAX to facilitate global access to the COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, and we're encouraging other countries to do very much the same. Uh, I mentioned already NATO, uh, that is a, a key part of our longstanding goal policy commitment for Europe of trying to achieve a, a Europe that is whole, free, and at peace. And I would add uh, extremely prosperous as well. Um, we have underscored to our NATO allies, even expanding the alliance to include North Macedonia, where I served as ambassador some years ago, as the 30th ally uh, of uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And I think we recognize the significant progress uh, that many of our NATO allies have made in increasing uh, investments in defense, progress towards meeting um, the, the famous Wales pledge of spending 2% of gross domestic product on defense expenditures, but really focusing that on uh, expenditure for modernizing equipment for dealing with the new challenges of the 21st century, hybrid challenges, uh, high tech challenges. Uh, and um, of course, the, the technology has evolved greatly uh, even when we look at the situation in Iraq, as, as uh, Secretary Blinken said last week, we need to look at the threats and challenges of 2021, not of 2001, uh, and make sure that we are adapting um, holistic views, whether it's burden sharing uh, or the fundamental decisions we make about uh, where the Alliance has to focus its, uh, its strengths and resources. The uh, political challenges we face uh, around the world are often uh, masked by the economic challenges. Uh, and I think the COVID-19 crisis has made that very clear. Uh, the pandemic has, has laid bare some of the challenges we have to this international order. Um, and we have to acknowledge that there is a global power competition underway. Uh, I think in Europe, uh, we can very much see that Russia remains the most immediate threat to our collective security. Uh, Putin seeks to weaken the European project, uh, the European Union, uh, which I think has done so much to prevent uh, war in the post-World War II era uh, in a space that uh, really had spent uh, centuries and centuries in some form of conflict. Putin wants to undermine transatlantic unity in our resolve. He does that through disinformation, through threats, uh, through all kinds of malign activities, whether it's uh, poisoning uh, people in, in the United Kingdom with uh, nerve agents uh, or poisoning his own citizens, uh, Alexei Navalny, uh, an opposition leader uh, with similar nerve agents. Uh, we see the kind of uh, malign activities he's undertaken in terms of hacking. Um, the cyber threats uh, have been well embraced by the Kremlin to bully and to threaten individual states um, because uh, those states often will uh, want to pursue uh, not, not a policy or a, a future that is uh, um, a threat to, to Russia, but instead one that is independent because they see uh, a more positive future by uh, working uh, as we do in alliances. I think uh, Moscow is very much uh, sought to, to pursue hegemony over former Soviet countries uh, and is willing to use military force, as we've seen in Ukraine or Georgia, uh, ignoring their international obligations uh, to accomplish their goals. Uh, and we have to be ever vigilant. Uh, when I spent uh, time at the US European Command as the senior civilian there, uh, working for the commander, I was able to see the tremendous value of an integrated diplomatic and defense uh, approach uh, to these threats, um, whether it was Russian behavior in the Black Sea or the Baltic Sea, the Eastern Mediterranean, or indeed the high north and, and uh, the Arctic, uh, which continue. Um, we have uh, been working to make sure our diplomacy and our defense and security are, are aligned uh, to try to address those threats and uh, the recklessness that Russia pursues so often. Uh, a lot of this is really, of course, about standing up for sovereignty 
and territorial integrity in Ukraine uh, or in Georgia, as I mentioned, um, we've seen Russia ignore those um, those ideals and uh, do so in clear violation of principles to which they've signed up. The Helsinki Final Act uh, in 2025 will will mark 50 years. Uh, it was something that was agreed to then by the Soviet Union, but uh, uh, that moved on to Russia after the uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union. Um, and we're deeply concerned uh, about Russia's violation of those primary principles, as well as the increase that we can see today, in fact, uh, in terms of military deployments to Crimea along Ukraine's other borders and, uh, and the disinformation with which uh, the Putin regime is painting uh, not just Ukraine, but uh, the United States and our allies as some kind of threat. I just remind everyone that NATO is a defensive alliance. It was created as a defensive alliance. It is not offensive or as a threat to anyone unless those threats are directed against us. Turning to uh, the other real competition uh, that we see, of course, the People's Republic of China. Uh, and we have to be very clear eyed about that. Even from the European Bureau of perspective, we work very closely with our European partners, whether it's at the EU level or bilaterally uh, in looking at some of the threats that China poses uh, to our collective security, to, to our prosperity and to our values. Uh, I think the PRC is very much a full spectrum, long-term systemic rival. And it is the only country with the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to challenge the international system that we worked so hard to build from the ashes of the Second World War. And this is the point that uh, Secretary Blinken made uh, last month in Alaska uh, when he met with Chinese officials uh, who tried to say that uh, we were interfering in their own affairs when we talk about, uh, for instance, the way they treat uh, the Uyghurs um, or the crushing of democracy in, in Hong Kong. And in fact, those very actions uh, go against principles to which China has, has signed up and agreed through the United Nations. And if you're challenging those principles, you're challenging that order and those institutions, and that's of concern to us. And we're going to raise those issues and confident countries should not be uh, so concerned uh, about discussing those issues and differences. What China does is use gray zone tactics to provide uh, leverage over our policies um, and build long-term strategic advantage. Uh, and they have done so also to try to undercut transatlantic links that, uh, as I've indicated, have been crucial to our safety and security for the past uh, 75 years. China participates every single day in intellectual property threat, uh, theft of intellectual property that uh, has implications for our common defense um, and the long-term prosperity of our, our economies especially with some of the emerging and disruptive technologies. Um, and so China too has embarked on this uh, aggressive campaign to rewrite the rules of the international order in a manner that favors their sort of techno autocratic model at the expense of the democratic values and, and human rights that are so crucial to us. Also like the Russians using propaganda, disinformation and censorship uh, to try to silence its, its critics. Uh, I think the secretary was, uh, was really on the when, when he noted that China is the biggest geopolitical test of the 21st century. Um, and at the same time, we've been very clear that uh, we're prepared to have good and constructive relations with China, with Russia, or, uh, or other adversaries. Uh, we've also made clear that it's not um, about forcing allies into an us or them choice uh, over China, for instance, um, but there is no question that, that the coercive behavior that the Chinese pursue threatens our collective security. Uh, it doesn't mean, and I'll underscore that, that uh, countries, including the United States, can't work with China where possible. And we uh, want to do that, particularly on challenges like climate change. Uh, on uh, Later this week, on the 22nd Earth Day, um, we will uh, host a virtual climate summit to focus on uh, how we can work together, including with countries like China, particularly China, given its uh, economic size and what the impact they have on uh, 
not just uh, economy, but on uh, global climate, uh, the impact there and health security. Um, and so we will try to pursue uh, engagement, uh, even with those where we have strong differences in, in other areas. We do need to, to navigate challenges like climate, uh, again, together with partners. Uh, and that means working with our allies to uh, close gaps in areas like technology and infrastructure. Uh, and that is uh, very much a part of what we are engaged on uh, every day. I'd just like to say a few words and then uh, we can wrap up uh, these opening remarks and I look forward to, to your questions because I think that's often much more, um, much more interesting uh, about advancing US foreign policy in uh, the world of complex challenges that I've touched on. Um, we need a, an agile and talented workforce that leverages America's diversity as a force multiplier. And I think you've heard this uh, talked about by the president, certainly by the Secretary of State, um, affirming in, uh, in the early documents outlining our uh, national security strategy objectives that we must prioritize uh, diversity and equity and inclusion and accessibility as a national security imperative um, to ensure that we're getting critical perspectives uh, and talents uh, represented within our national security workforce. So here uh, in the European Bureau, um, the largest of the, the regional bureaus uh, in the State Department, we focus a lot on attracting and maintaining team members who have distinctive talents and experiences and backgrounds um, in a broad way uh, so that we can put together uh, a team to focus on uh, European, uh, transatlantic and Eurasian uh, relations for the department, uh, and that helps us uh, advance uh, our own collective abilities. Uh, here in the department, I'm proud that we uh, unveiled the, the first diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic framework, um, and we're very much uh, utilizing that as we recruit within the foreign service or our civil service to bring uh, uh, on uh, new generations into the State Department. Uh, in March, we highlighted uh, women in our bureau who were advancing U.S. foreign policy and national security efforts uh, in the U.S. and across Europe. I was very pleased uh, this morning to, to uh, listen in on phone calls between our new Deputy Secretary of State, Ambassador Wendy Sherman, uh, who is uh, a longtime uh, friend and colleague and mentor, uh, and my wife happens to be her executive assistant. Uh, she is the first woman uh, to be named Deputy Secretary of State. Uh, and that's a big step. She came on board and was sworn in last week after being confirmed by the Senate. Uh, and she held a, a string of calls with European counterparts um, this morning. Uh, so she's very much supportive of our efforts um, uh, to show uh, not only diversity in what we're doing, but uh, that we are, are looking at inclusion in terms of uh, an analyzing and thinking about the challenges that face us and how to, to approach them. So I just uh, close by saying to uh, all of you um, at UT, uh, as you embark on the next chapters of your professional careers after graduation, um, I'd reiterate that the, the Department of State is very committed to um, an inclusive and empowering work environment. And uh, I hope you will, like Gabriel, think of the uh, Foreign Service exam uh, and we have lots of resources online um, and in person to, uh, to have you take a look at us, bring your talents uh, to this, what I think is a very important um, uh, institution, the Department of State, but one that is not only diverse in its workforce, but incredibly diverse in the work we do and the themes and topics that we have to focus on, uh, national security, um, it requires us to, to be aware and tracking uh, all matter of, of interest. It's not just about political parties and uh, uh, you know global fora uh, and uh, summits. Um, every day we are focusing uh, with our colleagues in the, inter in the uh, intelligence community uh, at the uh, Pentagon and across the global combatant commands. And of course, coordinated by the National Security Council at the White House on uh, keeping Americans safe, uh, prosperous, and, uh, and representing our values in the world.
So thanks for uh, the opportunity to speak this morning and uh, um, look forward to questions and discussion for the next half hour. Great, thank you so much, Ambassador Rico. That was really, really excellent, excellent opening remarks. Um, I'm going to start it off with a uh, with a question of mine as we're as we're um, waiting for questions to roll in from the audience. Um, U.S. relations with Russia continue to face many challenges, including the re recent developments that you mentioned. Um, you know, the the uh, uh, imprisonment of Alexei Navalny, the Russian military buildup near Ukraine. Um, how is the Biden administration balancing the need to hold Russia to account? but while also maintaining working partnerships in, in areas of national interest? It's an excellent question, Gabriel, and, and very timely. Uh, one of the first things that um, President Biden uh, did um, coming into office uh, was to um, uh, extend um, uh, the, uh, the treaty to uh, you know, put a hold on uh, what we call the START Treaty, the new START Treaty, uh, which was going to expire. Uh, and the administration chose to do that for five years to give us uh, a, a place to work together uh, on arms control. Um, and uh, as made very clear to the Russians that we like to explore strategic stability uh, through talks, um, and yet being very clear at the same time that we have real concerns uh, with some of the Russian activities. Uh, we undertook a review. Uh, as we mentioned, of things like the the hack, the so-called solar winds uh, hack, uh, interference in our elections, the the treatment of Alexei uh, Navalny with uh, illegal nerve agents, uh, and this kind of uh, activity. Um, and the president's very clear: we're going to address those things, but yet we're ready to work with Russia on areas of mutual interest, and we think there are plenty of them. Uh, and that's the way we're moving forward. You note that he uh, offered, uh, invited President Putin to uh, uh, have a, a meeting. Uh, so we're looking forward to uh, hopefully um, the Russians responding to that and having some kind of a uh, presidential summit um, in, uh, in coming months this summer in Europe. Uh, President Putin will participate in this uh, climate summit that the White House is hosting later this week virtually. Uh, so it shows we can can work in certain areas. I think climate is one. The Arctic will be another. Uh, Russia, uh, along with the United States and six other countries, are members of the Arctic Council. There will be a, a ministerial meeting of, of that council held in Iceland, which has the presidency of the council this, this year. Um, and so uh, we are determined to be constructive where we can be, uh, but be very clear uh, where we uh, are addressing Russian malign actions and remind them that there are costs to those actions, uh, including uh, the, the sanctions that remain on them from their uh, invasion of Ukraine in 2014 and other sanctions from uh, invasion of Georgia in 2008. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question from one of our Brumley fellows, uh, Matthew Orr. Uh, he, he wants to know uh, a little bit about U.S. initiatives in Belarus uh, currently, because, um, you know, as we know, the, the protests that happened in Belarus uh, many months ago um, have kind of um, hit a plateau, and we haven't seen a lot of um, progress in terms of uh, democracy in Belarus. And so um, Matthew is wondering um, what other additional steps can the U.S. take um, to help the Belarusian people? Oh, thank you, Matthew, for that question. Uh, it's also very timely. Uh, literally, the last thing I was focused on before I uh, came down to, uh, to do this virtual engagement was about uh, Belarus. Uh, we've actually had a, a strategy focused on Belarus um, that has cut across uh, administrations um, in trying to see where we could improve relations and, and improve the situation in Belarus in terms of particularly um, democracy. Uh, we have not had an ambassador in Belarus since 2008 when they expelled our ambassador and most of the embassy staff pushing us down to a very small presence uh, in Minsk. But over time, we've tried to work uh, with the Belarusians to develop areas uh, where we could um, have conversations. Um, and uh, some years ago, when they began to respond by releasing political prisoners from their jails. We responded to, uh, um, to that by uh, having what's called a general license that suspended certain um, sanctions and restrictions 
and allowed uh, the private sector, U.S. private sector, to engage uh, in Belarus. This was um, embraced by uh, the Lukashenko regime, uh, and we saw some real positive developments there. The last Secretary of State, Secretary Pompeo, uh, even visited for about half a day in Minsk um, to continue pushing that forward. Uh, we had decided to return an ambassador. We worked as, as both countries. We would return ambassadors to our, our embassies and capitals. And in fact, we selected an ambassador. My colleague, Julie Fisher, um, was nominated and confirmed by the Senate as uh, ambassador to Belarus. Unfortunately, in August of last year, facing uh, an election, uh, Lukashenko uh, obviously did not have the confidence uh, that his uh, let's face it, fairly repressive uh, regime uh, was going to do well in those elections. And it, it was a farce. It was a complete, um, you know, he, he claimed to have won 80 plus percent of uh, the election. Uh, no one believed that uh, the election was far from free and fair. Uh, and uh, you saw the response. Belarusians in the street simply saying, this is unacceptable. What they want is a government that delivers for them. And instead what they have is a, a dictatorship that has uh, responded to, uh, to the outrage at these um, unfair elections uh, and taken to the streets for months and months. Um, many Belarusians being pushed out uh, into exile in neighboring countries uh, like Lithuania and Poland. And we have been, uh, working with them and working with allies again and working through the, the OSCE, uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe that I mentioned earlier, to try to encourage uh, steps in Belarus. Unfortunately, uh, he has, uh, Lukashenko has, has dug in um, to the great detriment of uh, his country and their people. Um, and uh, the progress that we, thought we would see step by step um, has really been thrown backwards. Our ambassador uh, has not gone to Belarus. They won't uh, issue her a visa for that purpose. But uh, right at this moment, she is back uh, in the region consulting again um, with uh, many of those um, in the uh, protest movements uh, to hear from them and with our, our allies. Um, and just today, we announced that that general license, which had been renewed for a number of years to give the opportunity for economic engagement for private sector to work uh, in Belarus. And there's been some, some real um, positive movement in the, in the IT sector in particular. Uh, we simply could not renew that general license. And so it was announced that the companies will have to wind down um, as the uh, license that exempted them from um, existing sanctions will not be renewed uh, this year. Uh, so we'll have to see uh, when and what Lukashenko decides to do um, when he's prepared to, uh, to actually deliver for his own people uh, the kind of government that uh, they're clearly asking for. Uh, the United States remains very dedicated to the Belarusian people and the ties that uh, we have with them. It's a, a important country geographically, 10 million people with great potential. And it's been very sad to see what's happened there uh, over the last uh, now about eight months. Absolutely. Part of my uh, Wrangell Fellowship took place at the US Health Key Commission. And so, like you said, I, I saw firsthand um, the OSCE's efforts to um, you know, help the Belarusian people. Um, but it, it has been difficult, like, it, like you said, because Lukashenko has has dug himself in. So hopefully yeah. we can we can see po positive um, development in that area. Uh, we have a question from uh, Luis Brokotsky. Um, he wants to know, how does the American government perceive uh, the Europe's uh, defense initiatives uh, in, the, in the foreseeable future? Um, you've had this kind of buzzword uh, going around DC about strategic autonomy. Um, and, and, you know, there's these questions about, you know, is Europe going to go it alone? Uh, what's going to happen to NATO? And so I was wondering what, what your thoughts were on that. That's a great question. Again, thanks for that. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm just back from Brussels last week um, and, uh, and the month before as well. Uh, I'm pleased to report that NATO itself, uh, you know, now in its uh, 72nd year, is actually doing extremely well. 
Uh, as noted, even when COVID struck, uh, we were able to bring in uh, the 30th member of the Alliance, North Macedonia, small country in the Balkans, but made great strides uh, and, and integrating into these transatlantic uh, structures is exactly uh, what's, what's helped bring uh, stability and peace to those parts of, of the Balkans, uh, which as you know, in the, in the post-Cold War era, uh, were the areas of, of greatest um, violence and insecurity in Europe since World War II. Um, and so they undertook uh, after the 70th anniversary that we hosted here in Washington um, of, of the Washington Treaty, which is what created NATO and uh, all of the documentation is deposited here. We, we hold those documents for, for the Alliance. Um, they undertook a, a review, what they called a forward-looking review process, um, which I think was timely to sort of say, hey, here we are after 70 years, um, various discussions about different aspects of, uh, of European defense, defense initiatives. Um, and the, the uh, Secretary General appointed a, a committee uh, that included uh, an American, my, my predecessor, in fact, um, but also uh, a dozen European colleagues, just to review where NATO should be uh, in 2030. Uh, and uh, the Secretary General has released a, a list of recommendations. Uh, those will be discussed um, leading up to and then uh, following the NATO summit that we expect to have. Uh, we're waiting for confirmation of that this summer um, as leaders get together. But in the meantime, uh, certainly some of these terms like strategic autonomy get bandied about. They mean different things to different people, I think. Um, we, uh, as a matter of policy, have continued to support the development of uh, defense initiatives by the European Union, uh, as long as they're coherent, interoperable, and complementary to NATO efforts. We really see NATO, with all of its uh, success um, in maintaining peace and stability and leaving a space for, for prosperity, um, because we're bound by the same set of values, um, NATO is really the backbone of our engagement on security uh, in the transatlantic space and with Europe. And participation of, of non-EU uh, NATO allies in these EU defense initiatives, they're known as by different things like the European Defense Fund and the Permanent Structured Defense Cooperation or PESCO. Um, these we believe will enhance NATO EU cooperation and strengthen transatlantic security. Um, and so uh, we welcome very much the EU's commitment itself to um, support the fullest uh, possible involvement of the US in uh, EU defense initiatives, just like we wanna see Europeans and European companies be able to participate in uh, American initiatives. And that was outlined very much in um, the um, statement that Secretary Blinken and the EU high representative um, uh, Borrell issued after their meeting in, in Brussels back in March. Um, so we've uh, formally requested to participate in, in some particular projects, and um, we're hoping to, uh, to seal an administrative arrangement between the United States and the European Defense Agency as soon as possible so that we can participate in those things, because we believe that kind of thing, absolutely uh, EU, whether they're individual member states or collectively, um, need to do more uh, on defense. We welcome all of that, but it should all be done in the rubric of, of NATO, uh, NATO compatibility, whatever strengthens and complements uh, the alliance, which is, has been so successful. So I think there's a lot of room there, um, but a lot of positive news too. Excellent. Um, okay, so we have uh, Jessica, who's a uh, Wrangell fellow as well um, over at Georgetown. Um, her question is, Central Asia is a nexus of great power competition between the US, China, and Russia. Our policies there have been mainly focused on hard security, counterterrorism, border security, and connection to Afghanistan. Should that continue to be our strategy there? And what important opportunities for cooperation and engagement are we missing, or should we consider more seriously? Also a good question. Wrangle fellows are, are terrific. Um, you know, Central Asia is vitally important for those uh, who may not be familiar. That usually refers to the five 
former Soviet republics uh, in Central Asia. They belong to a separate bureau in terms of our, our structure, uh, organizational structure and administrative structure here um, at the department, the Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs. Um, but we do have overlap with the European and Eurasian Bureau, uh, largely in the field of, of the assistance money. Our, um, our Office of Assistance uh, covers Central Asia as well. And uh, that gives us um, some longstanding ties there, which are important. Indeed, hard security is, is vital in that part of the world. They have strong ties to Russia as well. They face terrorist threats. Uh, they're in a, a difficult neighborhood, um, neighboring Afghanistan, of course. Um, but uh, there are actually a lot of initiatives that involve uh, what one might say softer power, the development assistance, USAID, Peace Corps, uh, others that have been uh, involved in, in that part of the world. We have uh, embassies that are very engaged in all of those countries. Um, and uh, indeed we, we try to work, work very closely. Is there more that can be done? I, I suspect yes. Um, like anybody, we sometimes face a uh, sort of, uh, enough stuff on our desks and our plates at any given time. But when I was at European Command, um, we were undertaking a, an initiative to work more closely with Central Command to share experiences um, and how we can have uh, you know, our programs in Europe engage with the programs that we have in other countries, uh, because those countries raise their hands sometimes in Central Asia and say, hey, we're, we're here. Uh, and they have great connectivity with other countries of the former Soviet Union, a number of which are already NATO members, like the, the three Baltic countries. They have connections going back to the Soviet period when they studied together at the same universities. Um, they speak the same languages, in, in many cases, Russian. Um, and uh, so they will have great insights. And we need to do a better job of making sure we're, um, we're sharing information on that. So it's something uh, definitely to do, but I think Central Asia will continue to be in the focus, uh, particularly now as we look to withdrawing our troops, the final uh, troops from Afghanistan, but as the president has said, maintaining uh, appropriate um, resources in the region to be able to deal with uh, any threats in terms of uh, terrorism or other threats to our interests and those of our allies. Excellent, and uh, Ambassador Riker, you brought up languages and uh, Catherine Baker has a question. Um, do you believe that the, the department's in-country work would benefit from an increase in the diversity of languages that it teaches? So, for example, should it utilize the heritage languages not taught by the Foreign Service Institute, like Irish or Wolof, um, that its employees bring with them as the department increases its hiring or di of diverse candidates? That's a great question. I, you know, I think any language uh, can be useful. Um, yeah, there was an old joke when I joined the Foreign Service almost 30 years ago. It's like, well, if you come in, uh, you know, speaking German, they will send you to China. Um, not because that you speak German, but it was the way it worked. I, I think, and I'm not an expert on that side of our, uh, of our house, as it were, um, but I do think there is uh, attention paid to that. What, what are our, we, we get tremendous, um, uh, tremendously qualified, extraordinary people of, of all ages, not just uh, new graduates um, applying for the Foreign Service or joining through the civil service ranks um, here in the department. And they bring this incredible array of, of skills. And, and you're absolutely right. Part of the, the diversity is about uh, languages uh, or exposure to different languages or, or uh, um, cultures that I think uh, can be very important. Sometimes that can apply directly um, and be useful in, in a country um, or at a particular posting. Other times it's, it's more intuitive. And I found over all these years, it's amazing where you cross paths and where you'll find um, you know, what, what brings you together. I remember working uh, in, when I was in, in the Kosovo conflict and I spoke uh, Macedonian, which is a Slavic language closely related to Bulgarian not that far from Russian, other Slavic languages. Uh, and I was trying to speak with some of the Albanian speakers uh, from Kosovo. Now, of course, a lot of them did speak Serbian. They certainly understood it. Uh, they didn't want to, but when, when you got right down to it and I was talking, 
I remember having a conversation with uh, um, Hashim Thachi, who uh, went on later to become president of, of Kosovo. And, and he didn't speak English that well at that time. He does now. Um, but I said, look, you know, I think if I speak Macedonian and you speak Serbian, we can probably communicate enough to get by. Otherwise, it's going to be sort of tough. And uh, he smiled about that, and we we did okay. Um, so that's one of the the challenges of being a, a diplomat, a foreign service professional, is utilizing whatever resources you have to try to communicate first and foremost, and understand uh, the the views of um, of your interlocutors, uh, even when they're uh, competitive views, disagreements. Um, communication is the basis of all of this. Excellent. Um, so we have a question from um, one of my colleagues here at the LBJ School, Azim Edwin. Um, he wants to ask about um, diversity and inclusion uh, initiatives, some of what you, you mentioned earlier uh, in your opening remarks. And so, you know, we've seen um, the, uh, the recent introduction of a chief diversity and inclusion officer at the State Department, um, Ambassador Gina Abercrombie Winstanley. And so um, his question, it rely, you know, is asking, um, what progress do you hope to be seen uh, or do you hope to see made uh, in U EUR or across the department as a whole in terms of uh, diversity and inclusion? Well, I, I think, first of all, I, I feel like there has been progress. Um, and it's something that we as a society are also trying to address. Um, I am a great believer in the idea that America's strength is in its diversity. Um, that's been the case from the founding uh, of our republic and before. Um, and I think it's... Um, more so in a world that is so complex itself. Um, we have to be agile and, and not just talented, but able to adapt. Um, and, uh, and in that context, you know, diversity is a force multiplier. Um, and so we have taken that on board, certainly here in, in the European Bureau. Um, now you take a look at me and I probably don't look like um, the picture of, of the most diverse foreign service officer in the world. Uh, and I'm, I'm conscious of that, um, uh, but uh, we all bring something to the table and our determination is to continue to seek diversity, to be inclusive um, and, and just make that a part of, of our goal and that th we will see uh, a change over time uh, in doing that. And I, I think um, we have begun in the Bureau. There's some statistics we can point to in terms of recruiting. Um, some of the things we found uh, through research is um, you have to uh, really go out there and, and push and encourage um, people from different, different ethnic groups, for instance, to, uh, to be more interested in European uh, assignments, working in the European Bureau. Uh, it's not just a matter, you know, we, we open it up and, and uh, there's a, a bidding process for assignments um, and anyone can put their bid in. Uh, and there's been a feeling for whatever reason that, well, maybe I am not necessarily destined for a European job. We're trying to, to change that idea and get people to think about European jobs in terms of what they offer. Uh, and just as we were saying, it could be certain languages, it could be um, certain experiences, cultural experiences, family background that could really be helpful in a European context, because look how diverse some of these European countries and societies are becoming at the very same time. Gabriel and I sure saw this in, in Milan. Uh, you know, the, the diversity there, of course, we were there doing a World's Fair, so people were coming from, from around the globe. Um, but just living in Milan, if you look at the, um, the immigration on, on, uh, over the years to uh, uh, in a population of Italians, which is aging, and they've, they've brought in uh, immigrants the challenges they face in terms of uh, illegal migration or uh, uh, refugees from uh, you know, across the Mediterranean, Northern Africa, from crises in Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq. Um, these are all things they have to deal with and uh, bringing in people who have experience in that and letting those audiences and letting our partners see uh, the diverse quality of America, I think just tells a great story. Uh, so we brought in to the Bureau um, an officer who is just focused on uh, programs, uh, and she brings to me and my, my uh, deputies ideas um, for how we can promote diversity, how we can recognize that, how we can be conscious 
uh, or watch out for uh, any kind of bias uh, in that. And, and I think that's been uh, really dynamic. So we're going to keep, keep at that and uh, just encourage the, the new generations to come to the State Department with a very open mind and uh, what, I, you know, what I believe is a, a true desire for us uh, to, to see, uh, again, a Foreign Service, a State Department that looks like America. Excellent. And, and as we're wrapping up, I just wanted to ask you one final question. Um, do you have any advice for anybody who um, is considering joining the Foreign Service, right? That, you know, maybe they attended this talk and they're like, huh, the Foreign Service, you know, I maybe never considered that before, but it sounds interesting. Uh, what pieces of advice would you, would you give them? Well, I think, you know, uh, an open mind, a desire to um, uh, first and foremost, understand your own country, because I think it's really important uh, that we know what America is about. And, and it is about many different things And that here within the department, there are great competing views. Uh, and we have processes to, to try to do that, to, to tell our story, um, but then to have a curiosity and an interest in what's going on in the world and a world that is, you know, it's a cliche to say, so interconnected uh, because of technology, because of travel, hopefully after COVID. Uh, but again, COVID itself, underscores that uh, you know health diplomacy um, science diplomacy is going to be so critical it's a part of the climate thing this is going to affect all of us um, and so you know we need people with a scientific background we need people with a good understanding of history global history uh, our own history and civics I have since the very first day I joined the Foreign Service I carry around in my briefcase sometimes even in my jacket pocket uh, a little copy of the uh, U.S. Constitution and Declaration of Independence, and I like to, to whip that out sometimes. And uh, you know, one of my favorite passages, of course, comes from the preamble, where I talk about you know the goal uh, as we created this nation um, uh, of uh, creating a more perfect union. But never have we said that it, it's done. We always have more to do. Um, and that's that's what our history has shown us. You know, there's an effort uh, now uh, working on the, the uh, 250th anniversary of the founding of the United States. Um, and that'll be here before we know it. And um, uh, I think it's a great time to reflect on, on that. So know your constitution, know um, uh, what this country is all about, despite our, our divisions, which are so much you know, in our faces every day, um, that there's something special here that, that we have, that we've created, um, and that we can uh, share with the world in the sense that we want to have partnerships, we want to have alliances, we need them uh, in order to deal with the challenges we have, um, and really is what the Foreign Service is about. And whether you choose uh, to go into the intelligence world, intelligence community is, is always recruiting as well, uh, Foreign Service through the Foreign Service exam or uh, the State Department through the Civil Service um, and other ways. You've done Peace Corps, Gabriel. It's a great way to, um, to, to take uh, American values uh, and show them to help others in the world. Uh, terrific program. Uh, so I just encourage everyone to, to give it a try and, and understand that particularly, I think um, now, uh, in these times, it's not necessarily a lifelong career. Uh, I joined and I really thought if I stayed five years, that would be fine. I would have gotten an MBA. I keep thinking I, at some point I'm supposed to go work for a bank. Uh, and that, that just hasn't happened yet. I ended up staying this long, but uh, uh, be prepared to think about this as a, a short-term career, medium-term, uh, something you do for a while and maybe go off or maybe come back. Uh, or come to later. A lot of uh, the best diplomats and foreign service officers choose this as a second or third career. Excellent. Well, Ambassador Reeker, thank you so, so much for, for your time with us. Um, it, it, excellent catching up with you. Um, but I think I think everybody here got a lot out of uh, out of our discussion and, uh, and the priorities set by, by the Bureau and then by the department as a whole. So uh, I just want to say thank you again and for being here with us. Thanks for having me and, and good luck to all of you. And, and thanks for what you're doing at, at the school. Uh, it's great to see UT Austin focus so much on uh, the importance of international relations uh, and national security. So thanks everyone have a great spring.